Good to see you guys. Glad you are here. And uh, come on in, find a place to, see, to sit. For those of you who are with us for the first time, we're glad you're here. Action Church. I know Jay Salamone, so we're glad that uh, you're here. And uh, it's good to have you with us. Let's see, I think I saw John Frost. Did I see John Frost come in? John, are you here? No, no, no. John is the preseason caller for the St. Louis Cardinals. Baseball season. How many of you are excited about baseball season? Yeah, all right. Okay. Ba baseball, isn't baseball, yeah. How many of you are not excited about baseball season, huh? All right, okay. Baseball is an excuse to go out and sit and drink beer, I think. And that's, uh, and Christians have to discuss that, but there it is. But uh, glad you guys are all here. Forge really is about building great men as God defines greatness. That's what we're about. And, and that means it takes uh, every, every week. We're involved. Every week, every day, men who make it happen uh, get in there and, and grow and seek to grow every week because manhood is not a thing that waits around. Uh, you're either moving forward or you're sliding backwards. So uh, that's why we're at it week after week. I love what Mark Twain said. We talked about drinking beer, and now I'm talking about smoking a cigar. I guess this is for Lutherans and Methodists and Presbyterians. Baptists, you're not listening to this. But uh, uh, Mark Twain, the author, said this about smoking cigars. He says, I smoke in moderation, only one cigar at a time. <laughs> uh, and yeah, I think, I think uh, that's, that's, that's an underhanded uh, backdoor way of talking about focus, one at a time. He's really focused on what he does there. Uh, but many Christian men think, uh, I, I think sometimes they think uh, of that way about following Jesus. I only follow Jesus in moderation. You don't want to get too freaky about that. You don't want to get too all in about following Jesus. Jesus is kind of in moderation. Except the thing I've learned and uh, about Jesus, and I'm, I'm reading the New Testament to my, through. My goal this year is reading it through three times. I've finished it once. I'm in my second read. And I realized reading the Gospels again this year, uh, Jesus is not about moderation, right? I learned that. You know, you, you read it and go, Jesus is an all-in kind of guy. He polarizes people. He's our Lord, he's our master, and you gotta be all in with Jesus. And, and the reason for that, and it really relates to our series, is if you are not all in for Jesus, you're gonna get eaten alive. You are, if, if you're dabbling, Christianity is not really about religion, is it? It's about really following Jesus and, and, and an eternal relationship. But if you're dabbling with Christianity, you're gonna get eaten alive because the wolves are out there. They are out there, and that's the name of our series. Uh, running with the wolves as we uh, work through First Peter. But Jesus said this in Matthew 7, 15. He said, beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are not just wolves, ravenous wolves. We got a restaurant in town called the Ravenous Pig, right? There are ravenous wolves and they are out to get you. Matthew 10, 16, Jesus said, Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So, and then he says this, So be shrewd as serpents and innocent as doves. But beware of men, for they will hand you over to the courts and scourge you in the synagogues. Who was it that talked to me last week after Forge and told me about Eric Metaxas' book on Bonhoeffer? Which one? Who was it? Anybody? Probably not here today. Well, he taught me about Bonhoeffer's book, uh, uh, the book, uh, Eric Metaxas' book about uh, uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the pastor in Germany, the Lutheran pastor in Germany, um, who, uh, who really was in the plot to kill Adolf Hitler. And it's fascinating. I always love it when I hear about a pastor that was out to kill somebody. You know, it's just, <laughs> it's so unusual. It gets your attention. But Adolf Hitler, listen to me, I looked up some of the things he was saying. As you know, Hitler was the head of the National Socialist Party uh, in, in Germany called the Nazis. Uh, Adolf is a contraction of the old German Edelwolf. Did you know that? I didn't know that. I read the book and it didn't stand out to me. Uh, so I went back and looked at it. There it is. Adolf is an old German uh, contraction of uh, noble wolf. Hitler adopted the wolf. He loved the wolf. He had three military headquarters during the Battle of France, 
His headquarters there was called Wolf's Gorge. I could say it in German, but you wouldn't understand it. Actually, I can't say it in German. <laughs> I would butcher it. Uh, in France, it was Wolf's Gorge. In, in uh, Eastern Front, it was Werewolf. In Prussia, it was Wolf's Lair. The composer Wagner used to call him Uncle Wolf. Uh, he loved the wild, carnivorous, Darwinian ruthlessness of a wolf. And, and so the wolf really is a symbol uh, down through history, as well as in those that love to crush other people, uh, of, of, of wildness and of murderous ferocity. And Jesus says, I'm sending you out in the midst of those kinds of people. That's who, that's who we really are living amongst. And we live in a country that is a little bit more civilized now, getting less civilized. Have you noticed it? Getting less civil with every generation as we go. And as I was thinking about this text, I was thinking, how in the world do we as Christian men run with the wolves? How do you thrive in the midst of uh, of, of a really difficult world. It's by banding together, number one. That's, that's important. But it's by being tougher than the wolves. How are we going to make it? We got to be tougher than the wolves. We got to have a ferocity level that is a little, that's greater than the wolves. And in our text for today, Peter shows us how. So we're going to look at 1 Peter 1, verses 3 through 12. I'm going to read it. I'm going to unpack it. And I want to say in advance, team leaders, you got to have your heads up for what I'm going through today because we're, as you notice on your outline, I don't have questions because each one of these four points is so big that I can only deal with it in a cursory manner, and then your team is going to have to select one of those to deal with because you probably can't deal with all of them. Uh, but, uh, but they'll be important. So here we go. You ready? First Peter 3, 1, 3 through 12. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, Peter writes, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again, to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away. Reserved in heaven for you. Who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed to you in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice. Even though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been distressed by various trials. So that... The proof of your faith being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls." As to this salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you made careful searches and inquires, seeking to know what person or time the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating as he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you in these things which now have been announced to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. Whew, this is God's word. Long text, right? Peter, uh, writing in Koine Greek of the first century, actually writes one sentence. That's about, about really one sentence in the Greek. We can't do that. So if, if your translation of the English Bible uh, chops that up a bunch, it's because we have to do that. Uh, we don't speak this way in long sentences connected by and, 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 and. We split it up more. And so if your translation was different than mine, that's why. Because different English translations try to split it up. All right. Team leaders, do you see why you got to pick one of these topics that we're going to look at? Because this is a long text. How do we run with the wolves? And um, how do we get tougher than the wolves? Well, there are four ways. The first way is worship for our salvation. And you say, worship, 
how is this talking about worship? Well, notice he starts out in verse 3, and what's the word he used? Talk to me. What's the word he uses to start this out? Blessed. The word blessed. This is a eulogy. The word blessed uh, is the word we translate, comes from the Greek word eulageo or uh, eulogy. And a eulogy, where do we say eulogies usually, guys? At funerals. I have done more funerals than I can count. And at funerals, when they do the eulogy part where they're talking about the, the person who died, we got to be careful because when somebody dies, what do we tend to do? Tend to make them a saint. I was at a funeral with my mentor, Steve Brown. He did part and I did, I did part of it. And uh, uh, Steve spoke before I spoke. And so he got up and, and they'd done the eulogy. And the eulogy was so flowery. It made the guy like the fourth member of the Trinity. <laughs> So Steve Brown got up and said, hey, uh, you know, bottom line, uh, Charlie was a sinner, <laughs> you know, and, uh, and, and then so that made me preaching the gospel much easier uh, because, uh, see, in eulogies, we tend, at, at human funerals, we tend to make them out to be fourth member of the Trinity. But here, the word blessed, eulageo, uh, actually, it's the noun, not the verb. It, 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 he, he's, he's praising God, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who, who has caused us to be born again to a living hope. So notice what he's doing in these verses. And I'm going to unpack a couple of other things here. But what he's doing here is he's worshiping God in this blessing at the beginning of his letter. And all the New Testament writers start their letters off with blessings, don't they, guys? Paul does it. Peter does it. John does it almost all the time. But he's worshiping God for our great salvation. So worship if it's done rightly, is praising God for all that he has done in creation and redemption. So worship weekly, worship privately when you pri worship God. Worship is one of those ways that we become stronger as men and actually become fiercer than the wolves. You say, come on, worship, that doesn't make sense. All right, let me ask you this. How many of you guys like to sing, really like to sing in church on Sunday morning? If you really like to sing in church, on so hold your hand up. All right, look around. That's not even 50%. You, I mean, you, some of you didn't deliberately did not raise your hand. How many of you don't really like to sing in worship on Sunday morning at church? You really don't? Good, I saw that hand. I see that hand. I see that hand. Thank you. There, there, there are times... A lot of guys don't like to sing. But let me ask you this, is worship just singing? No, it's not. But oftentimes, that's what we have devolved it into. So if you don't like to sing on Sunday morning, God bless you, that's okay. But singing is a part of a response, isn't it? Worship involves more than just singing. It's, it's, it's remembering. It's praising with words. It's prayer. You worship God as you sit and discipline yourself to listen to a 30-minute sermon. Yeah, because you're giving your time to listen and to process what God would say to you. So worship is bigger than just singing. But here he's, he's, he's causing us to understand what God has done in, for us in our salvation. So worship is theocentric. It's God-centered. It's Christocentric. It's Christ-centered because God has brought us our salvation, right? And notice what he says. He says he blesses God for who in his great mercy. Mercy is what, guys? Mercy is withholding from you what you deserve. And what I deserve, which is, because of our sin, what do we deserve? A lot. A lot. Hell. We deserve hell. Grace is giving you what you don't deserve. Mercy is withholding what you do deserve. And so Paul's, uh, Peter says here that we worship God because in his great mercy, his great mercy has caused us to be born again uh, to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, to an inheritance which is imperishable, undefiled, and will not fade away. Reserved in heaven for you. And so guys, when we worship, it energizes us. It should energize us because it's theocentric. It's God-centered. We're looking at the power and the grace and the mercy of God. That's why God mandated that we go one day in seven. 
Some of you don't have a church home. You need to find one. We are pro-local church, pro, pro-pastor. We, you got, this is not church. We don't do the worship dimension. We lift up God, but we don't do some of the other full-orbed sense of worship. And so uh, worship is important for us to be a part of that in a corporate sense. And so as we worship God for our salvation, we remember one in seven. Forge is a part of that. Our daily appointment with God, our dog, where we worship God. Corporate worship, though, is unique. This past Sunday, I had the opportunity of baptizing my grandson, Joel's son, uh, uh, in, in his church. It was really an incredible opportunity. I almost didn't make it through, and, um, but it was really an honor. Wyatt Anthony Alwinson, if he follows Jesus, will be the fifth, the fifth Alwinson male to follow, fifth generation Allenson male to follow Jesus Christ. We're a ministry family. Um, vocational ministry is kind of skipped generations. My grandfather was a missionary doctor to Venezuela. I'm in the ministry uh, vocationally. And so I told him it's probably up to Wyatt now. He has to go to seminary. So uh, uh, that's not cheap. So I'm praying, I'm saving for that, right? Uh, Joel, God bless you. You better start saving too. Uh, but the reality is, it, it, when you see somebody baptized, what should it remind you of? Your baptism. When we come together, we worship, we remember, and we get a huge, shocking sense of grace and mercy every week. That's what it ought to be. Jack Perry uh, in Longwood uh, said, said to me the other, last week after Forge, he said, you know, I, I'm amazed that God would love me. And, and that's what motivates us. It's a means of keeping us focused. And so engage in worship uh, and, and, and remember that, that worship gives a ferocity to us as we remember how great God is. And as you go out among the wolves, you're going out as the son of the most high God. And your God is greater than the wolves. And if you worship, and, and partly, partly a lot of us guys don't worship. We kind of just sit there and we don't engage. And when we don't engage, we're not ready to go out among the wolves. Okay? So worship for salvation, Peter says, uh, makes us more fierce than the wolves. Uh, proving through trial. Uh, this is the next one. Uh, you greatly rejoice about your salvation, even though for a little while now, you've been distressed by various trials. Uh, uh, that the proof of your faith being more precious than what, guys? Gold. Gold. So what Peter says is that what strengthens us, toughens us, and makes us valuable as men that can fight with the wolves, run with the wolves, become more fierce, is when we allow trials to cause us to grow, to test our faith. Now, if you wake up, woke up today and you said, I just, Jesus, I hope you make my life more miserable. There's something wrong with you, right? I, I, you know, and, and, and I pray for you, and, you know, but, but, but the reality is, is that a Christian, a Christian man understands the real world. It's broken, it's fallen, and you will be confronted. My friends in law enforcement know that there are bad guys out there. A lot of us, a lot of us don't think about that. We think everybody's good because our culture says everybody's good. You're in business, you know there are bad guys out there. Former military, you know bad guys are out there. Christians, Christian men, they're bad guys out there and they are trying to get you since the Garden of Eden. So we, we try to bring that up because our culture tells us, you no, know, life is good and everybody's good. Are you kidding me? That doesn't, that doesn't uh, play out in reality. And so the proving of the trial sends the message, I'm in the good fight. Whenever you face distress, remember that distress can be turned into you stress. Bad stress can be turned into you stress, good stress. Because without stress, there is no growth. That's why you go to the gym. You gotta put your muscles under strength if you want them to get any bigger. Um, even though now for a little while uh, you have been distressed. And it's important to understand that most trials don't last forever. Some do, some are longer than others. 
But most trials go pretty quickly. And you'll get through it. My first uh, bad trial as a pastor was from one of my bad mistakes. And I called my mentor up and I, and I told him what the mistake I made, which I'm not telling you today. And, um, and he, said, uh, he said, well, Pete, in five years, you'll be over it. <laughs> and you know what? It was almost five years to the day. But you know, I'm better for it. And I grew through it and I was stronger through it, proving through trial. Trial says, what? What is really going on within, within me? It's a wake-up call. Men need wake-up calls. We need wax on the side of the head because we get so focused. And notice, though, uh, character. Oh, character. Remember we talked about the pillars of greatness? Pillars of greatness, third one, character. A great men develop great character, but that can only come through trials. When things are good, you think you're good. I think I'm good. It's character that shows us that we're not. And when we are proven through trial, it leads to praise and glory and honor when Jesus comes back for you and for him. Praise and glory and honor. Uh, love and faith, verses 8 and 9. I'm going to ramp this up, go a little quicker here. Uh, notice, love and faith, verses 8 and 9. He says, though you do not see him now, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. This is talking about the love and the joy that, that the gospel brought happiness and joy to Peter. Peter was a happy man. He was a joyful man. He was motivated from the inside out. What's it like living with an unhappy man? How does your wife feel? about an unhappy man. Those of you who aren't married yet, when you're not happy, what do you bring into the home? Well, you're not married yet, so you bring yourself. But if you don't get this thing worked out when you get married, the reality is what are you gonna bring home? Death, destruction, discouragement. <laughs> what are the biggest problems we men face is when we're home, we're not really present. And then when we are, we bring our work with us. Every man, if he's going to be successful in marriage, better figure it out. Got to figure it out. How to make a, a distinction between your work and your home life and punch the clock, to use an old metaphor, of one job and, and come home ready to engage as the husband, as the father in your home. P Peter, Peter says here that joy and happiness is, is the greatest motive. And by the way, guys, love... Love for God, because he loved us, is the greatest motivator in life. I will tell you that, that, um, that guilt is a motivator, isn't it? The guilt, the, the gift that keeps on giving. How long does that last? Until you get ticked off of the guilt giver and move away from him. Duty lasts for a while, right? Uh, but then you get over that. Yesterday, uh, Brad Merrill and I were called into jury duty. He got called in early, earlier than me, and then, um, and then dismissed. And told me he got dismissed. I got dismissed, but I had to come back. And then I was there for the rest of the day. I was sitting for hours yesterday. And I just about lost my mind. And I'll tell you, the only thing that kept me alive was... This is my duty for my country. But it only lasts so long. And I'm praying already that never comes back to me again. But I'll tell you what motivates more than anything else. God bless you, Brad. And I hope you get called in again. <laughs> you got a year. I got a year. I'll tell you what is the motivator. Love. Uh, the greatest motivator of all is love. And Christian men often don't feel God's love for them. But you can only love once you've been loved. And then you can only love to the extent to which you've been loved. And if you've been loved perfectly by the God of the universe, that and Peter was, and he allowed that love to be rejuvenated every week when he gathered with the saints. And in his daily appointment with God every morning, then love is what gets us out there and keeps us moving and keeps us in action. And when you focus on the gospel, it makes you a happy man 
And happiness is a serious problem. Let me say this. I agree with Dennis Prager that we as Christians, he would say as Jewish men, he would say for every man, but I think as Christian men, we have a moral obligation to be happy. Because happy people become good people. And, and, and if your emotions, this is a big subject, isn't it? It's huge. Happiness and joyfulness go hand in hand. And we men need to allow the gospel to make us happier, joyful men. For the good of God, for the glory of other people around us. Now, it makes us tougher than wolves. Wolves aren't happy. Wolves are always snarling. Wolves are always out to get you. And I always love it when somebody was out to get me as a pastor. And they are out to get your pastor. You men protect your pastors. Because they are out to get you. There's a lot of wonderful sheep in the church. And, and there are always a couple of wolves. They're, some of them are even born again wolves. They're just born again immature. They come after us. And I always love it when a wolf would snarl there. I would smile. This was after a few years when I learned that they're there. I love them, but you got to fight. All right, there it is. Love, love. Perspective in time. This is our last one. You can talk about it. Verses 10 through uh, 12. Sends the message here at what Paul is talking about. He says, as to this great salvation... He says, the, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come made careful searches and inquiries, seeking to know what person or time the Spirit of Christ within them. And then he says, he says, the prophets of the Old Testament wanted to know when the Messiah was going to come. And the prophets of the Old Testament didn't have a clue. It turns out they were serving you. So what Peter is saying here is that when we have this sense that you and I as men following Christ, are living in the time of fulfillment. Uh, in redemption history, look at that. We talk about the flow of history from Genesis. First of all, there's creation, right? And then there was the rebellion, known as the fall to many, but the rebellion. And then the promise that a Messiah would come. And then he has come. Uh, but there's a, a coming consummation. We live between, between the time of the fulfillment of the coming of Christ uh, between that time and the final coming. And all of the ages of history are centered on us, men. And the prophets long to understand this. The angels, Paul says, Peter says, long to understand all this. And they didn't. And Peter is making a huge point. He's saying, when you and I understand that all of the ages of redemption history fall on us and the fulfillment is all on us, and all this was done for us, that we might spread the kingdom of God. It gives you that sense of when you go out into the world, you go out maybe as an alien, as a stranger. That's true. But you know you're on the winning side. Because even though the bulk of culture seems to be opposed to us, the reality is we don't have to be whiners. Because we're winners. It's because all of the ages have come to bear fruit on us. And this leads to a muscular Christian masculinity. These four points. So that the wolves out there, are we're not terrified by them. We are confident. Oh, fourth pillar of greatness, confidence. Identity, right? Purpose, character, confidence, legacy. When we go out there with all of this, we actually become more fierce. And yes, I'm saying that Jesus saved you to make you fierce. Not with your wives, not with your kids, not with your grandkids. Fierce at the right time. With the wolves. Pick one of those topics, talk about it around your table. I'll get you out of here on time. All right, gentlemen, <clears throat> it is that time. Here we go. Try to get you out with the wolves. 
Those of you who are with us for the first time, we're glad you're here. We hope we haven't run you off, and we hope that you'll come back uh, and be with us again. Uh, I want to give props to Oviedo City Church, splitting the table here, growing their men. They got another table. Let's give it up. Let's give it up. Way to go. All right. Couple of announcements. So that, that begs the question, invite your friends, invite your enemies, invite the wolves. Uh, they'll hear a different message here, but uh, we, we have room for them. Remember that we need a, a couple of guys in our life, one or two guys that, we're t that are a fire team. And for some of you, that's not a uh, language that you get. Maybe it's accountability group. Maybe it's, it's just a, a buddy, a brother, something. We need guys in our life to help keep us on the right path uh, because life is a challenge. Uh, living by ourselves. Uh, we want to encourage you to become a partner, and you guys are partners. Go to forgebiblestudy.com and become a partner. Some of you guys get badgered by us because your credit card changes, and man in the mirror who does our back office stuff right now gets in touch and says, hey, your credit card's gone bad. That happens all the time, so don't worry about it. If we come after you and say, hey, credit card's bad, can you give us a new number or whatever? Do that so we don't go belly up, okay? Thank you. Uh, sign up for the eblast, forgebiblestudy.com. Couple of announcements. By the way, Kelly Wilson is our man back in the back. Put your hand up, Kelly. If you have an announcement, we can squeeze in one or two at the very end, but that's all we can do. Uh, but I want you to note, you get it to Kelly and he'll, he'll prioritize them for us. But we, we don't want to forget the church security conference coming up. Talk to Jason White right over there and the Leap of Faith of Dialogue, Tom Saunders right over there. These are important events coming up that relate to us as men in our churches. And now I got to put my hat on. All right, what does it say? It says, you can't see it. You guys need glasses. It says, sheepdog. Now, why am I wearing this? I, I'm wearing this hat because uh, one of my friends who lives out of state is an Aikido expert. He sent it to me and said, wear it once or I will kill you. <laughs> and um, uh, bottom line is he could take on four or five or six of us at a, at a time. And so, so I'm doing that because he watches the videos. He was in Saudi Arabia recently where you can't take Bibles or anything, but he took his phone and he took Forge videos. He said, I know my room was probably bugged, but um, I played it out loud. So we have been in Saudi Arabia. <laughs> He's a sheepdog. He's a sheepdog, right? And so he sent me this. And plus, he promised to give thousands of dollars to Forge if I wore it in a video. <laughs> Actually, he did not, but I'm obligating him to that right now. Um, but you know what, what? What's my point? My point here is that we're not to become wolves. But we are to become sheepdogs. And I love Lieutenant uh, 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 Colonel David Grossman's book on killing and on combat. And those of you who are sheepdogs and warriors, you've read those books and you understand that he says at, at one analysis, there's three types of people. There's sheep, there's wolves, and there's sheepdogs. And sheepdogs have enough ferocity that they can chase off a wolf. They got enough bark, they got enough teeth, they got enough activity. They've got enough ferocity. That they can chase off the wolves. And so for those in law enforcement, the sheepdog idea, and some of you are real sheepdogs. And he gave it to me because he said, you're a sheepdog with men. I go, I guess. But I want you to have a little bit more ferocity. Because that's what, we, because men have been called to stand up for the gospel. Right? I, I'm reading this book right now my wife gave me at Christmas, Double Crossed. It's a book uh, uh, about pastors and missionaries in World War II who ended up doing some work for our government behind the scenes in Nazi Germany and in other places. Um, one of the guys said this, let it be understood once and for all that we who have worked abroad do not subscribe to the absurdity that all religions are equally good any more than all automobiles. They fought for Christianity because they, they believed, and our country, but mostly Christianity. They fought for our country because they believed that Christianity was not on an equal level with all other religions, but was superior. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. 
Yet you and I have been shaped by an educational system that says all cultures, all religions are equal. Jesus would disagree. We invite them here. We will love them. We will be kind to them. We will interact with them. We will share our country with them. But as Christians, make no mistake about it, we fight for Jesus and we smile even in the face of the wolves as we invite them to Christ. Go out there and fight for Jesus who is the way and the truth and the life. Your culture needs you. Your family needs you to have that much ferocity for him. Let's pray. Our great God, how challenging it is to be your sons in the 21st century here in America. And yet how challenging it was for the first century Christians raised as aliens and strangers in a world that didn't understand them. And so I pray for myself, I pray for my brothers as we head out into a world that doesn't understand us, by and large is opposed to us. And we pray that you would give us your grace and mercy in our hearts that you would build in us that ability, that strength, that power to run with the wolves and to turn and look at them and invite them to Jesus. Given the right time, help us to be your men and not to roll over. And we just commit this to you. Thank you that you have entrusted to us at this point in history the great pleasure of fighting for you. We give you honor and praise as we head out there in Jesus' strong name. Amen. Amen. Guys, have a great rest of the week. We'll see you.